So Brian, a lot of free thinking has been suppressed and would you say that times are changing sufficiently, in other words consciousness is rising sufficiently that that's going to change? I'm thinking particularly of free energy. Yes, that's a subject I was interested in um, when I was a very young uh, design draftsman back in the 60s. Uh, we talked about free energy, uh, photoelectric cells um, and uh, getting energy, energy from the sun mainly on water. And uh, a lot of, on my research, a lot of devices running cars on water, mm -hmm. for example, uh, internal combustion engine will run on on many substances other than uh, than petrol, uh, but as many researchers have found, these these have been suppressed, and uh, people have invented many uh, working models of the free energy devices, and uh, these have, they've either been bought out or bumped off, as we say, and these uh, secrets put under lock and key because it represents the threat to certain authorities mm. who don't want us having free energy mm. because uh, mm. otherwise um, they lose their power. Mm. Mm. And uh, I've always admired uh, um, <clears throat> inventors who invent these things and one of my heroes was, was Tesla who at the beginning of the 20th century in, uh, invented a lot of uh, free energy devices uh, harnessing power from, from lightning and uh, transmitting elect electrical signals so that we wouldn't need all these wires and pylons going everywhere so it was transmitted electricity waves were were transmitted and people picked them up and could operate lights and power um, many devices uh, have been put under lock and key uh, to, to probably never see the light of day because of vested interests mm -hmm. but uh, yes I, I I'm all for uh, deep thinkers and inventors, inventing free energy devices. And talking of energy, we know this is a universe made up entirely of energy. And it's got all kinds of secrets that we don't yet know about. But I'm curious, do you think we're alone in this universe? Highly unlikely that we're alone. Um, who are we um, living on this tiny speck of dust in the backyard of the universe to think that we're alone? And when we look at a universe that's billions of light years across, and when we think that light travels at just over 186,000 miles per second, how far does it travel in one year? <clears throat> and we're talking of <clears throat> thousands of light years across the universe. And it doesn't surprise me at all when there's talk of advanced races uh, operating <coughs> millions of light years across from the other side of the universe and I don't see why we shouldn't travel faster than the speed of light <coughs> <coughs> or project ourselves in an instant from one dimension to another and, and, and then fully materialise. It's um, been well documented, particularly in military files, that uh, unidentified flying objects, <coughs> in other words, military hardware that can't be identified travel in our airspace mm. and these devices have been tracked at thousands of miles an hour by very high spec military aircraft picked up on radar and I don't think there's a, a pilot in the world that hasn't at some time seen what people call unidentified flying objects and a pilot is the best person to identify a flying object because if it's not known to them, they know every aircraft that's flying. If it's not known to them, then it becomes, unidenti becomes unidentified. And the military in virtually every nation have been involved uh, in um, documenting mm -hmm. uh, these uh, unidentified flying objects. And uh, many good books, particularly by Timothy Good, have been written on the subject. A uh, fascinating subject that one could spend the rest of one's life uh, studying and the evidence is out there. Fascinating though it may be as to where they come from, who they are, what do they want. 
and I think archaeologists and researchers have found that there's excellent evidence that they have landed on this planet thousands of years ago and left artifacts and evidence that they were here. Uh, but I think a lot of that has been suppressed as well and there have been many good books written on that subject that we, we are not alone, uh, far from it and uh, I think the authorities know that we're not alone but to tell the public would create tremendous fear but uh, thankfully there are researchers who have documented this in, in many good journals and books. Well, I think we're going to have to be a bit patient a bit longer, aren't we, to find the answer to that, but who knows? Who yes, knows? It's fascinating. Fa fascinating subject. It is. It um, is. Something that I looked at for, for many years, and uh, I was first introduced it, to it by a retired policeman who'd studied the subject from the 1950s. Uh, I found it fascinating being an engineer. If these are flying, mm. if these are flying machines, um, what are they? Where do they come from? Um, how do they work? How can they travel at thousands of miles an hour? Or picked up on radar one minute and uh, disappeared off the radar the next. Uh, I think it was about 1968. I was in Devon with my family on holiday, and my boys were quite small then, and um, we went into this um, pub down in Devon to get some food and drink and it was getting dusk well, when I came out into the outside the pub to, 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 with the food and the drink for my boys uh, to partake everybody was looking up in the sky and when I looked up as well I could see two very bright lights, blinding white lights up in the sky and uh, we stared at this for a long time. They were silent, almost blinding as we looked at them. And then we heard the sound of jet engines. And when we looked uh, in the distance, we could see the lights of two, two fighter planes gaining on these two very bright lights. And when the planes got within a certain distance of these bright lights, they shot off at tremendous speed. One minute they were overhead and the next minute they were on the horizon and gone within seconds. Well, in the papers the next day we read a very small article that said that two identified flying objects had been seen and aircraft from the local RAF base had been sent to investigate but found nothing. Well, we know they found something because we all <laughs> saw it. So that was intriguing. Mm, this is the cover-up of the press. Okay, <coughs> I'd like to ask you, Brian, about the power of healing. I want to ask you about how it is that people can be seriously ill and then have a seemingly um, spontaneous healing. I want to ask you about the power that each of us have to heal ourselves, and that some would say medicine can't heal you, some other person can't heal you unless you want to be healed. You must have some interesting stories on that topic. Yes, I do, and healing has a chapter in its own right in my book. And the reason it has a chapter is because I was heavily involved for 30 years with what people call the laying on of hands or spiritual healing and I first had an introduction to spiritual healing back in 1968 when my mother uh, suffered badly with a corrosive uh, osteoarthritic hip and was in terrible pain and somebody suggested to her that she try spiritual healing mm. and my mother said well I'd try anything to get out of this pain because the medical profession at the time could do nothing. So she went to this healer in Watford and after six visits, half an hour each time, she was 98% cured. No more pain. She could go dancing, gardening. She could do minor DIY. So what do you think was going on there? What, what do you think the healer was stimulating there? At the time I didn't know. Uh, and I questioned my mother, I said, and perhaps it was auto-suggestion. 
Uh, and when you think about it, to auto suggest somebody with a severe arthritic hip to get better is pretty powerful stuff. Mm. But she said no. He just talked about the weather and going on weather, going on holiday, and just asking questions. He wasn't really interested in what was wrong. He just put his hands over her head and then moved them down round her body, and uh, she could feel tremendous heat um, at the place where her hip had disintegrated. But uh, he never asked her, he never suggested anything, and uh, he never charged. Uh, so that's quite amazing. That really made me think, I suppose that was a wake-up call as well, because uh, I couldn't understand how a lay person with no medical knowledge could uh, be of such benefit to my mother when the medical profession couldn't. So how would you explain that now? Looking back? Explain it now, well, because uh, I'd had experience of both receiving healing from healers and giving healing over the years to other people. Uh, as I explained earlier, it's the energy channeling the natural energies of the universe through a compassionate, loving person to another person. And it, I found it didn't matter whether they were human or animal. Animals respond very well, and babies respond very well to the channeling of this energy. Uh, now they call it Reiki healing, which is the same sort of energy. It's ch through a compassionate person. Mm. And everyone who has compassion, is loving, kind, uh, is a natural healer. And it's natural to them to put their arms around and comfort somebody mm. who is suffering. And uh, so they are giving natural healing. So what would you say that some people would say that illness can come to give you a message? In many ways, illnesses have made people think, uh, change change their attitude to life, change their priorities. Um, a serious illness where somebody uh, could nearly have died is very life-changing and uh, no longer is the trivia of life important to them anymore. Mm -hmm. Their values change mm -hmm. uh, to what they should have been in the first place. And it's quite noticeable that uh, dis-ease in the head through people who worry, are anxious, fear, um, creates dis-ease in the body because these negative emotions must come out somewhere and they can come out as migraines or arthritis or it upsets the immune system, stops the immune system from uh, healing the body. A uh, very effective device is the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, it can deal with virtually anything in including the serious diseases. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what it's for, is to protect our body mm -hmm. and to heal us if we get damaged in an accident or fall out of a tree. Um, a wonderful system, but of course with our lifestyles in the Western world, uh, uh, with the amount of uh, uh, junk that we put into our mouths uh, mm -hmm. in, in the way of what we call food, uh, destroys the immune system. Uh, therefore, it can't do its job properly. And since the body relies on nourishment, vitamins, minerals and enzymes going in every day, because that's what keeps it in good condition, mm -hmm. uh, if, if we are putting in processed foods day in, day out, and chemical laden drinks and food, mm -hmm. then it's going to destroy mm -hmm. the immune system. Mm -hmm. Hence we become ill. Mm -hmm. And we suffer from um, degenerative diseases in the Western world that in um, Eastern countries, for example, or indigenous tribes uh, in remote places of the world don't suffer from uh, because they eat more natural food. And have less stress probably. And they have less stress, yes, because uh, stress, fear, worry, anxiety plays a big part uh, in keeping the body healthy or making it sick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can I ask you a little bit about the power of prayer in healing because I know that for many years you've run a healing group. Would you like to talk about how powerful that collective energy of a prayer group can be in sending healing? Yes, uh, very effective. We have a healing list with, with uh, many names on that we read out every morning after our meditation. Um, but collective prayer or healing prayer Absent healing, which is sending out thoughts. Again, we are back to the power of thought. Mm -hmm. But he's sending positive thoughts to people who uh, are sick, not very well, diseased, mm -hmm. um, who need uplifting. Their, their immune systems 
need boosting, sending these thoughts out because, as we have said, thoughts are living things. Mm -hmm. So what is prayer? It's only silent or, or spoken thoughts. In love, love, peace and harmony, I send, mm -hmm. we send healing in the name of love and light to Mrs. So-and-so or to Peter or to Mary or John. Or, mm -hmm. And those thoughts go out. We are channeling them out to that person. And since if we think of somebody, thoughts go out to them. Mm -hmm. And they can pick it up, even if they don't appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And it's very noticeable to sensitive people who can pick up thoughts, positive thoughts and negative thoughts that are being directed to them. And that's why it always pays to be on your guard if you're walking, you're walking uh, where there's a lot of people because lots of negative thoughts can go out which you can pick up mm -hmm. and you can come back feeling depressed and tired mm -hmm. because you've been picking mm -hmm. up all these negative thoughts from Mr and Mrs Average who think very negative. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I always put uh, a cloak of protection around me when I go where there's a lot of people because you can get drained of energy. Mm -hmm. But yes, prayer, a healing prayer, is a, is a force for good. And uh, you can heal. Uh, even even the, uh, the ancients, or the pagans, uh, as they are called, knew the power of prayer. And um, earth energies, the earth is a living cell, and it gives off energy. And in different places on the earth, there are power points or energy centers, uh, particularly where what we call ley lines um, cross. You get a power point, hence um, the pagans built their sacred sites where ley lines crossed because they were drawing on the energy. And then the Christians uh, came along and demolished the pagan sites and built their churches uh, over these power points. The um, harnessing the energy. The harnessing the earth. energy, yes. Uh, and even something as simple as hugging a tree, or touching a tree, it can be a very powerful kind of calming effect and ha can have on your content. It can, and I've said this in the book, in the chapter on love, because trees draw energy from the ground through their roots, mm -hmm. and they convert um, carbon monoxide, dioxide, into oxygen, that is their job, through their leaves, mm -hmm. and they store energy, and by putting out sensitive people can feel the energy in a tree, mm -hmm. and if people have become depressed or tired, they can, they can be, uh, receive a boost of energy from a tree. It will give its energy to you if you do it in love and ask, ask for the healing. It's drawing earth energies up. And uh, this is why primitive peoples went barefoot because they are picking up the energies from the earth and uh, wearing, wearing shoes, walking on concrete, doesn't do us much good in the Western world, so we are not drawing these energies up. And that's why people who live in the country like walking in bare feet uh, on the ground. Mm. Natural mm. energies. Mm. I now want to bring you to the topic of happiness. Mm. The endless quest that people have for happiness. And they look in quite extraordinary places sometimes, shops, bars, <laughs> all kinds of places, looking for happiness, aren't they? They buy things, they get addicted to things, people, they think a person will make them happy. Um, what would you like to say to the person who now feels unhappy and wants more happiness in their life? What would your advice to them be? Again, another chapter in my book on happiness, and I've called it the elusive happiness that so many seek but few can find. It's that carrot on a stick. It's always that, that much away. Mm -hmm. And people will, are going to find happiness when they do this, they do that, if only I had, if. And it's always if I will find, I will find happiness when. And many think that a plastic credit card is going to bring them <laughs> happiness by a spend, spend, spend philosophy. I need to realize that Debt doesn't bring happiness, it brings uh, depression and sadness. And that today's um, gadget and gizmo is tomorrow's out of date gadget and gizmo. So it's a never ending cycle, all wanting the latest mm. to bring them this mm. happiness. Uh, instead of understanding that happiness comes from within, it doesn't come from 
without. It is not in a material object. Money makes us comfortable, but it doesn't bring happiness. And uh, it's quite evident to see that people who live in indigenous tribes, for example, are a lot happier than people in the Western world. And we found this when we visited India over 20 years ago. Uh, people, the poorer people, were much happier than the wealthy people and uh, with the children because they, they didn't have much, uh, but they didn't have much to cause them worries and fears and they didn't have anything to steal. Nobody was going to break in and steal something because they didn't have much. And they didn't have to worry about investments and losing their money in stocks and shares and uh, worrying about if the washing machine and the car broke down or whatever because they didn't have these things but they got their pleasures from the simple things in life. Mm -hmm. And realising that the love uh, from friends and family was the most important thing in life. And uh, people seek happiness outside outside of family into material things and think that dream kitchens, dream houses, dream holidays, dream cars bring happiness but it's a dream that turns to a nightmare in many cases uh, but love, unconditional love, once again the law of life uh, brings the most happiness mm -hmm. and when we understand our spiritual heritage that we that we should be living a spiritual life, which is kindness, spiritual being, kindness, compassion, love, and treating other people with respect. Treat other people as you'd want to be treated yourself. That has been said many times in different philosophies, uh, which is a simple code of conduct. And uh, it is the simple things in life that confuse the ignorant and the arrogant. Uh, and this is why I have found that they never understand um, what makes life tick, the meaning and purpose to life. Um, they never understand the nature of a universe based on love, peace and harmony. And they will always deny that a God uh, doesn't exist uh, because they cannot conceive of love, peace and harmony within themselves. And it's, it's quite noticeable that people that haven't got love, peace and harmony within themselves are unhappy and so depressed. Why is it that people find it so hard to look inside themselves, Brian? Why do they why do they seem to want to distract themselves with the out there and not feel able to or even maybe it's that they don't know there's anything of value inside them. Maybe their self esteem is so low they don't know that what they're looking for is in there. If they just peeled up off off the, the limiting beliefs that, that they set up to say that I'm not good enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough. And actually, we're all perfectly good enough, aren't we, at our very core? All of us are unique. So, in theory, none of us should suffer from low self-esteem, whether we're rich or poor. Mm. Mm. Uh, hence, meditation is the key to going within. And meditation has been taught for thousands of years in many cultures and uh, particularly the mystical aspects of all the major religions started off teaching meditation. Mm -hmm. The Sufi religion, for example, teaches meditation going within. Mm -hmm. um, Buddhism. I mm -hmm. uh, became very interested in Tibetan Buddhism because it teaches Buddha, Buddha taught go within and touch your very soul within meditation, still the thoughts, mm -hmm. quieten the mind, and things will be revealed to you that bring you an inner peace and harmony. Mm -hmm. And um, he called it enlightenment, um, which is the exact opposite of ignorance. And it's quite noticeable that people who do serious meditation are calm, peaceful, and kind, and project uh, a wonderful aura of love and uh, lovely people to be around and I think the Buddhist philosophy which attracted me uh, a, a lot in the early years and if I was going to put a religious label around my neck then I would be a Buddhist mm -hmm. but I don't like labels around my neck I prefer to be freelance in my thinking mm -hmm. 
But Buddhism is a wonderful um, philosophy because what could be better than a man sitting meditating, which is the logo of Buddhism, the Buddha sitting meditating in the peace and harmony. So when you talk about meditation, that makes me start thinking about the ego. And many of us struggle with the ego. Mm. What happens to the ego during meditation? When I say the ego, I mean, you know, the voice in the back of your head that's always talking to you. What, what's going on there? Would you like to talk about that? Yes. Um, teaching meditation is to learn to still the thoughts as best as possible. Because when we sit quiet, you see the mind is always chattering. Chatter, 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 chatter. And people say it's very difficult to still the thoughts. When thoughts of yesterday, tomorrow and today keep coming in mm. when they're trying to be still. Mm. And, uh, and it is hard. It I mean, is very hard. It's very challenging. And it takes, it takes uh, a lot of practice. Hence a good teacher. Mm. Uh, but once it's been achieved, an inner peace and harmony beyond description um, uh, is experienced. And you don't want to come out of it when you get into a state of peace and harmony and can sit there for hours. Mm -hmm. And um, you real this is this is how the mystics of old and the seers, sages and, and spiritual masters uh, centuries ago, through meditation, realized that we're just we are more than flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And by going within, as as many of the spiritual great spiritual teachers have said you can touch your very own soul or the over-self as um, mm. Dr. Paul Brunton called it in his, in his writings and then you will know uh, that you are a spiritual being uh, and that you are not just flesh and blood, this is merely the spacesuit that the uh, spiritual aspect uses to walk around on this um, materialistic planet and once, we ha once um, <laughs> it becomes old too old and diseased or damaged to use, then, then we abandon the uh, space suit and consciousness, which is in the astral body that we talked about earlier, um, leaves to go into another dimension, a frequency that it's compatible with. And the frequency that the astral body is compatible with is all uh, down to the amount of love we have shown in our lives and how we have lived our lives because everything in life is made up of atoms, the building blocks of life, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which vibrate at certain frequencies. Mm -hmm. That's why you and I can see each other as solid, because we're vibrating on a similar frequency. And the same with this chair. We can see this is made up of atoms. Everything that we see around us is made up of vibrating atoms on certain frequencies. Well, the astral body is also affected by frequencies. And what affects this frequency uh, the most is the amount of love or hatred that we have in our system. Our ego, if you like. The ego that wants to be top dog, win at all costs, mm -hmm. dominate, mm -hmm. uh, destroy. And it's fear, isn't it? The really? ego is fear of dying. Yes, fear the of dying. Ego yes. Is frightened of dying. Yes. And once this knowledge of life uh, is understood, then the fear of dying and the fear of life um, no longer exists, it dissolves. Mm -hmm. It is love, love that determines everything, the amount of love that we have in our life. Okay, so let me ask you this. If you were to give a tip to, to um, the listeners now, the audience now, for them to be able to feel more love. For myself as a yoga teacher, I would say it's about opening the heart chakra. Would you, would you say that that was a good exercise to do? Perhaps you can help people, guide them as, as to how to feel more love. Because a lot of people feel a lot of other things rather than love. All that umbrella stuff that comes under fear. All those shame and guilt and all of that stuff. And, and it's a habit that they're in. So to shift into the discipline of opening the heart chakra and feeling love is not always that easy for people, is it? No, it's not. And very few people understand the meaning of love or are able to give love. So how would you say that they can, they can do that? What, 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 is there a tip that you could give them? A lot of people are frightened to show because they think it's, an, they think it's a weak emotion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, particularly uh, the arrogant and ignorant amongst us mm. um, think that showing love is a weakness. Mm. 
and that um, instead of understanding that it is, uh, spiritually speaking, it is a great strength. Mm. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether we show, if we're incapable of showing love to another human being, if we show, we can show it to, to plants, mm. a garden, we can show mm. it to animals. Um, a lot of people <coughs> have pets and a pet is a good example that will give unconditional love mm -hmm. to its um, to its owner. So you're saying start with something easy. Start, start with, with something what you can easy. love. Uh, yes. Feel um, love for. Mm. And this I have also covered in my book mm. because I'm a huggy sort of person, and so all our family and friends, and we all hug when we meet, and <clears throat> it's quite easy to see the lack of love within a person if they don't respond to a hug because they're frightened. Uh, fear, really, I suppose, is, is behind it all. And hence, they cannot show this love, so they have a low self-esteem. And a lot of it can be down to childhood trauma um, uh, with um, being bullied at school or bullying parents. Um, and people big, lock down their heart space. They, they lock do. Down. Victims of... Um, Domestic abuse, mm. and, uh, mm. from a very early age, uh, find it very difficult to trust. It's mm. trusting people again, mm. so therefore they can have low self-esteem and therefore uh, find it very difficult to love. But I've always maintained that uh, even the most hardened criminal um, or tyrant mm. has a love somewhere, mm. uh, it, even if it's for their dear old mum or a, or, a, or a pet. And sometimes people need to be shown love, don't they, to be able to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to be loving. They need it to be shown how, how that is, because as you say, for some people they don't experience that. No, that's quite right. Um, we, see that we see it in, um, in certain countries where there is disharmony, discord, violence between certain sections of the community. Um, Children are taught to hate from a very early age, mm. um, goes down the generations. Mm. So that's made me think about something else, about, about separatism, which is not about love, is it? And so much in the world is about separatism, you could say religion is about separatism, certainly uh, racism is about separatism, and that's completely the opposite to this... Um, place that we want to get to, which is this, this drawing together of the collective consciousness. Would you like to say something about that? Yes. Um, the moment we put a label round our neck, um, we say, yes, I, I am British, I am French, I am German, I am Russian, I am this, I am that. We are segregated into different nationalities, and we know that na different nationalities um, find it very easy to uh, uh, go to war and mm. have done for thousands mm. of years. Mm. Uh, we know that putting a religious label around our neck segregates us immediately. I am Protestant, I am Catholic, I am Muslim, I, I am Christian, mm. uh, I am a Buddhist, I am a Hindu. So immediately we put a label around our neck and we mm. segregate ourselves. Mm. Um, and it's very difficult once we become heard, in herd, mm. segregated, to integrate. Whereas if we realise, once we realise the bigger picture and we start to look at life spiritually, what does it matter what political party we, we support, what religion we belong to, what country we live in? We're all earth people, we all live on the earth, we all have families, we all came from the one source out there in the universe and back to that we will go eventually. And so my favourite race, the Native American Indians, uh, realised that everything was linked in the web of life and that what we do to harm anything else in that web harms ourself because everything is linked. Mm. So to segregate ourselves and make ourselves look different from somebody else is really ironic and laughable. So you're saying that when we do harm to somebody else we're actually doing harm to ourselves? Exactly, that's, that's the law of life, that's, that's what I said, karma. Uh, what we give out, we get back. And you can't get a better uh, statement than as you sow, so you will reap. Mm. 
what you give out in your life so you will get back. Well, and that is very easy to observe in life.